We know about tragedy. We know about this. Shooting, shooting, shooting for your stars. Shot my shot and I hit moms. Alright, well let's get into it. Alright, hey everyone, welcome to episode four. Is that right? Yes. Yes, yeah, episode is. four. We're back after our long layoff due to personal reasons, but we're back and we're here to stay. We've got Max with us today. Hi. Oh. And Ben. Yeah, I'm here again, unfortunately. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about yourself then, Max. About me. Um I suppose the interesting stuff is, um, Nax, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a Muay Thai fighter who's originally from Manchester, England. Mm. Um, I lived in Perth for nine years before I moved here. I moved to Canberra seven months ago and I'm now 20 years old. I've been fighting for 15, six, 16 years now. Mm. Um, and it's now become my job to full time coach and fight. And I suppose that's why I'm interested. <laughs> no, I'm not very interested. Uh, what brought you to Perth? My dad was made redundant in England. And I think, I, I can't remember at the time because I was only about 11, 10, mm. 11 years old. Mm. But um, he got made redundant. I think he found another job that he just hated. Mm -hmm. He didn't like it. Mm. Um, and so, against mine and my sister's will, because we both didn't want to come at the time, mm -hmm. um, shipped on out to Perth, and he got a job here, or in, in, in Perth, and then never looked back, really. Um, as far as I'm concerned, Perth is like is like home. Other than my family in, in Manchester, mm. I wouldn't really even ever consider going back to live, you know, to live there, mm. to visit, of course, okay. but not, not to live there, no. Perth, Perth is what I would have considered home. Yeah, I guess that's where you'd be like most of your growing up. Yeah, for sure, nice. for sure. And and it's just much nicer, you know? Mm. And much nicer than, than, than Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> Great times in Manchester at the moment. Mason Greenwood. Yeah. Oh, 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 God. Oh, yeah. God. Do, we bring, do you bring that up on the podcast? Or <laughs> be quiet? Don't be like Mason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't be like Mason. He's in a bit yeah. of strife, it's yeah. definitely fair to say. Oh, yeah, I he... swear, though, I swear it's like every English dad's dream to move to Australia. Because my dad, I, we like grew yeah. up in England as well. Yeah. My dad moved to Australia. Your dad. Yeah, gave England us the option. Well. well, he gave us the option between Canada or here. And. So to be fair, we didn't really pick anything. He just kind of decided for us, I'm pretty sure. So. Both not bad choices, then, though, isn't it? No, no, yeah, no, no, no. Canada or, or Australia. Yeah, but it's yeah. either really cold or really hot. Really so, nice yeah. or, like, really bogany nice. Yeah, that's <laughs> a fair point, actually. <laughs> so have you met any bogans in Australia, then? Plenty. Plenty. <laughs> I've become one. <laughs> Those who don't know, my bogan accent is... Do one. Try it. We've got to hear it. We've got to hear it. Can't it out now, no way. <laughs> the pressure's on, actually. Come on. Hey gal, mate. Hey gal, hey gal, mate. Yeah, we can't do that for five minutes. No, 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 for sure. But tell us about your fighting. Tell us, you know, some of your experiences in that in that world. Um, yeah, I suppose if if experiencing anything in life, it's it's Muay Thai and and what experiences that has brought me. Um, I had my first fight when I was five, mm. five years old. Oh, Basically didn't stop since, like, since then all the way now until I'm 20. So I'm 21 this year. Mm. Um, but yeah, I've, I've had some good experiences, bad experiences. Flying all over the world, I got to uh, do a little bit of like living in Thailand when I was like 15, 16, 17. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's just flew me all over the place. I think that that some of the most experience, like like life changing experiences were like being forced to to become a bit more of an adult early mm -hmm. um, as far as like performing in front of an audience and a crowd um, going and understanding foreign cultures mm. as well having fought in like places like Langkawi in Malaysia yeah, wow. um, Bangkok rural Thailand like other, other countries you know England and Australia as well they're all gone out of my head now, but a few different countries like that, you know. Um, and just the, the rapid culture shock between them and having to learn to understand and integrate with different cultures, mm. especially in Thailand, because that's where I spent quite a bit of time. 
um, at a young age, just understanding things like different people and, and, and the way they grew up is very different to the way I did. Um, yeah, I think that's what brought me a lot of like experience in life, I suppose. I value that more than I do like books mm. or, or being able to articulate things. You like learning by doing. Yeah, so yeah, a lot yeah. a lot of my life has been that. Although I've always been decent at school. Mm. Like I was always pretty good at school and I was always pretty good at talking as well. Mm -hmm. But um, as you can tell, I don't show up. <laughs> but um, yeah, like I, I did a lot of learning through doing, just by doing Muay Thai and traveling and, and getting the opportunity to go all over the world with that mm. um, has, has given me the experience. And I think the confidence to be able to talk and to be able to give my all in things like school or like in, in Muay Thai or diving into a job that's across the country from my family or, yeah. you know, Muay Thai has given me that confidence and that opportunity to do that. So I would gauge that as the main experience, like the experience I gained was, was just by doing, by living and being in different places like that mm. more than anything else. How was the... Um the experience in Thailand compared to anywhere else you've been? Like, the training, how different was the training? How, how difficult even. was the lifestyle change, the challenges that you faced over there? Yeah, I think as far as, as, far as training, training-wise, anybody who's been to Thailand will tell you the same thing. It's just managing burnout. Mm. Because Thailand training, although it is like the, what we would consider the Mecca, in the beginning of Muay Thai, it is not the best training regime in the world. Mm. In fact, if anything, it is probably on paper the worst. Mm. It's very, very dangerous and very bad for your body, some of the practices in which they carry out. Mm. For example, six days of the week, getting up at 5 a.m. and running 15 kilometers before three hours training in the morning, yeah. and then going to bed and training again at 3 p.m. for three hours. 3 p.m. till 6 p.m. and then the next morning you do it again mm. until you get to Sunday and when you get to Sunday Sunday's over so quickly that you wish it was Sunday on Monday mm. if that makes sense no, that makes the the training is brutal but the one thing that it does give you is mental toughness when you come back mm. like a lot of the time one of Kieran's main jobs with people like Diandra David Josh and I is just making sure we don't do too much and peak too early. Mm. For example, David has had eight and like ten weeks notice on this fight, which is pretty like pretty unheard of in, in earlier experience Muay Thai. As you get more experience, you get more notice. Mm. But David's had about ten weeks, and his job is not to burn out. Mm. He's fit now; he's ready to go. He could fight in in a week or two's time. The only difference is the weight, but mm. the David is so used to being hell for leather and just going and going and going until he burns out that Kieran's main job is to just go, no, David, don't, don't, don't kill do yourself it. now. Yeah. Don't overdo it now. He was actually saying it to us yesterday. He gave us, he gave us uh, we were meant to have a double session day. We did one mm. strength session in the morning. Mm. He got us to shadow box in the ring and, and then he went, okay, go home. Mm. Like, you, you don't have to train again today. Mm. Which was like, was, was, weird for us to experience coming from and living in Thailand and, and being in that environment mm -hmm. yeah. is where is more is always better mm -hmm. but it's not actually always more is better sometimes mm -hmm. it's better to pull back mm -hmm. both in a physical sense but also your mental burnout too mm -hmm. yeah do, doing too much just makes you not want to do it anymore yeah. it's yeah. quality over quantity yeah it's yeah, so that kind of balance between working hard and working smart yes yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. And, and it's definitely a it's a more difficult balancing act than people make it out to be, yeah. especially in a not so modern sport like Muay Thai. Mm. It's quite ancient in its practice mm. and its culture, but that doesn't mean that the way that we train and the way that we perform as athletes should be any different to mm. any other sports. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it, yeah, compared to, for example, football, like there's been studies on studies on studies on what's going to get the best out of athletes. Mm. Like, Ronaldo doesn't get up and run 20 k's every day mm. as much as some Ronaldo fans would like to yeah, yeah, right? yeah. like he gets up and he does what he's told to do which is going to maximise his performance mm. and so that's something that credit to Moyu has it's modern modern athleticism with real Muay Thai mm. and that's like the 
the combining of the two makes it like mm. a really cool uh, place. I think it's really powerful you shared that because I think today in today's day and age, a lot of young people get told, "Oh, you gotta, you know, if you want to be an athlete, if you want to do this or that, you have to work super hard," you know. Mm. And they get told, "Oh, athletes train every single day. They go no hard every off. single day. No days off." You know, all these kind of ideals get put yeah. into young people's heads, and that could even translate into the real world where, like, they might want a job, for example, they might want to go study something at uni, and yeah. they're overworking themselves. Mm. But really, it's about knowing, okay, look. I'm a hard worker and that's good, but I do also need to take breaks, I do need to take rest, you know, so I can be ready not just for now, like you were saying, peak early, but also for my future. Mm. I need to be able to manage myself in a way I can really, you know, improve on things in the future as well. Yeah, and it's, I think it's because it's romanticised, isn't it? Mm. You know, it gets, like, this idea on your, on your, like, on the social media page when, like, you know, something pops up, it's like, grind like on the grind yeah. every day, <laughs> yeah. like working hard, yeah. the hardest work in the room, outworking mm. this guy, outworking that guy. Mm. <clears throat> yes, there's a time and a place for it, but it's not all the time as mm. well. Mm. Like you, you, the only thing that matters to me, as, as at least speaking from an athlete's point of view, mm. I would like to say I'm the hardest worker in the room all the time. Mm. That would, that was like, you know, in a romantic sense, like people love to say that. The competitive job. But at yeah. the end of the day, if I beat you on the night, then I don't care how we trained. Mm. Like, yeah. that is my only goal. Mm. So if I fight this person, that, and he's working harder than me in the gym, but it's actually at a, at a detriment for when we fight, mm. then is he really working harder? Mm. Yeah. Like, or, or is he just exhausting himself for something that mm. it's not going to work in the long run? Mm. Like, it takes more mental effort to sit back and go, is this a smart decision to do this 15K run when it's going to detriment my sparring on Saturday? Mm. Like that's that's yeah. takes more mental strength to be able to know that you are good enough regardless, mm. and that's where like a bulletproof mentality comes into play of knowing that sometimes it, yes you need to be working harder than the person next to you, but other times you just need to know that you're good enough. Mm. Like so, a lot of people don't realize they're good enough, and so they think they just have to do more yeah. and do more and do more mm. when it's not necessarily the case. Mm. The mm. person who works correctly and and works enough but the right way is the one that will succeed mm. not the person who just yeah. does the most and it's not even just about the physical you know it's about that mental side mm -hmm. as well where you're managing ego you're yeah. managing those sorts of things so i saw this thing as well like you're managing your own competitiveness even mm. i saw this thing where it's like this guy was talking to another guy and he was like would you rather earn 20 million or be given 20 million and i was like oh i want to earn it that's what i was thinking right yeah and the guy the guy who answered the question also said that but really, the guy who was speaking was like, no, you, you might as well get given the 20 million, you know? Yeah. Results speak for themselves. When you have 20 million, no one's gonna care how you got it. Yeah. And you're not gonna be like, no, I worked so hard. You know, you have 20 yeah. million, yeah. you're fine, you know? Mm -hmm. You can relax And that same kind of idea where it's like, look, you don't have to just, you know, do the kind of Kobe thing or, you know, mm -hmm. what you see where you're seeing people post the grind every single day, yeah. you know? Just do what works for you and let the results speak for themselves. Yeah, definitely. How did you manage that bulletproof mentality? How did that come around for you? Was there a deciding moment or a decisive factor where you went, all right, I think mentally I can do this now? I think I've always been borderline arrogant. <laughs> like, <laughs> my entire life, <laughs> no, that's what I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. <laughs> yeah. I've been borderline arrogant mm. my entire life. And a big reason why I came to Moyu is to manage that part of my training. Mm. Kieran knows my personality and he will never, we will never get to fight week and he will go, right, Mac, you need to believe in yourself. Like, you, you, you don't think you're good enough, but you are, literally will never be the problem for mm. me. You could yeah. put anybody in front of me and I would think I would beat them. Mm. The difference is like, I think when I grow it, growing up in Muay Thai for so long, I was able to just know that I was good enough because I've done it for that long. Yeah. Like I, in that sense, I never ever struggle mm. in a mental sense to do with Muay Thai. The, however, if you put me in a football situation and my own teammates get on my back, I fumble. Mm. I absolutely crumble. I need somebody to back me. Mm. Muay Thai is like it's almost like it's separate from everything else for me. Mm. I don't, I don't ever fumble mentally. Mm. Like very, very, very rarely mm. I do, but like not really. A t I couldn't even think of a time mm. when I last did that. But like I said, in, in a football sense or even in just general life, doubting myself for sure, 
um, it's something that like takes resilience and building, right? Like understanding that your mess ups are just mess ups, yeah. and then and then moving forward. Um, I think the only part regarding Muay Thai that I struggle with mentally is the weight, and um, it's something that has gotten better over time, but has something that has caused me a lot of like mental harm over the last so like I would say once I hit the age of maybe 13 13 or so round to around like now-ish mm. um, it's played a huge impact on the way that I live mm. um, and also like my my feelings of like public perception it's also caused me like some health problems as well you know mm. like for example we joked about before the esophagus thing yeah. or like my like when I dislocated my knee both of those had not necessarily direct relations to my diet mm. but had connecting factors which you could kind of stem back to yeah. my relation to food um, because that has probably been the most difficult aspect of my Muay Thai career so far mm. how did you come back from those two injuries because they weren't little injuries mm. they were both were pretty serious actually yeah. and mentally would have played a part because i know you pretty well you didn't stay calm whatsoever yeah. in that situation but how did you manage to deal with that yeah so as far as my knee went i had a i had a rough period afterwards because i was still an ad, like just an adult i think i fought um i turned 18 in that june I fought for WBC state title against Stephen Kirk in July. I fought Zach Anderson for the WBC national title in November. And then I was, I was fighting with Zach in a weird concept of tag team Muay Thai that's real similar to WWE tag team. <laughs> it yeah. is honestly the best dude, you'll dude, ever dude. watch. Yeah, it, it, it actually is. So, so what you can do, right? Say for example, this with the ring yeah. and Zach and I are fighting. Yeah. I fight. Yeah. If he comes back to the corner and touches me, we swap. And I, I just get keep out going back to the back corner. In. I let you. Yeah. Do. The only problem <laughs> is when you get in the ring, you start on the opponent's side. Oh, so you have yeah. to. Carry, it's like uh, go across the river. Or something yeah, like pretty yeah. much. You have to get back to your corner to be able to <laughs> to tag. The way I just run. Yeah, hundred percent. It is actually a really odd concept. Yeah. There was a moment where I think it was Zach went to tag you in. And the guy just threw it over. Yeah, jumped him in the head. back of the head. Oh, yeah. wow. It was yeah. just like scary yeah. as shit to watch. Yeah. Because right. you just go, you've literally turned your back in a ring, which is yeah. something you never should do, but, but you, you kind of need to tag your partner. You have no yeah. choice on that. Yeah. yeah. Like, and, then, and then I suppose for those who don't know, then I got in the ring for that fight after a really like big six months, right? Like the biggest six months of my career, I had just been bumped into the WBC rankings like everybody had been waiting for me to turn 18 to fight in Australia and I beat two really good fighters um, Zach still fights at a national level he's like one of the best at 61 um, and people had known him for a long time I just beat Zach um, and then we we became pretty good friends after that actually mm. and that's when we did the tag team together and I after he tagged me in in that fight I got in the ring and maybe about 25 seconds later um, my opponent hooked my heel in, in when he caught and swept me. And I landed funny and it popped my kneecap out to the side. Mm. Uh, so my kneecap was on the side and it broke my patella and the bone behind the patella as well. Yeah. So they broke on one another when it, when it was forced out of position, yeah. which sucked pretty bad. Like it was pretty horrible physically at the time. I'd never experienced pain in a fight like that. Mm. Um, so there was no thought of getting up at all. Mm. Um, and I lost, like, obviously lost that fight. Um, and then the recovery after that was pretty rough. Um, I was in a quite a bad mental place. Like, mm. I, I, I was on the up, on the up, on the up, and it was the first, like, heavy injury that had ever set me back. I had these plans to be the, like, the world's best at the youngest age. Mm. I had in my head that I was going to be a WBC national like world champion by the time I was like 20. Mm. I thought that I was going to be the youngest ever. Mm. I had it in my head that I was going to be George Mann. I was going to beat his record to the world title. Mm. I wanted a world title before he did. Mm. And like the, I think that 
coming back down to earth from that was really difficult because like I said, I've always been borderline arrogant and I think that I am better than everyone. Mm. In a Muay Thai sense, I believe that's true, but nobody's better than life. Mm. Mm. If life chooses that it's gonna take four or five years, then it's gonna take four or five years, whether you like it or not. Yep. Mm. And I had in my head that I could just defy everything and everyone. Mm. If the opportunity wasn't there, I would make it pretty much. Like I had that in my head. Yep. And now we've all seen, especially with COVID, that no matter how good you are at anything, if the opportunity's not there, you can't have it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which was a, a harsh reality for me to accept and has been a harsh reality for me to accept over like the last three years yeah. even though I have made progress mm. and I have fought like people like Simpayak who in the Muay Thai world is like one of the uh, further end of the like the best fighting like fighting at the elite level yeah. it's not what I planned to achieve by the time I was this age yeah. so um, swallowing that pill was very difficult and at first I didn't mm. I just thought that I could like soldier on through mm. until I had to deal with the whole rehab of my knee so I spent the first maybe two months of that just wallowing in my own in my own sadness mm. all my own like feelings uh, before picking myself up and then moving into that rehab and it actually felt surprisingly fulfilling and like, I felt like I was achieving a lot coming back, which gave me like a lot of a lot of happiness, you know. And then I was on the up again, um, on the way to greatness, as I suppose, as as I as I put it, and on my way up. And then I got offered a fight against Roy Wills in Australia. Roy Wills was like. You know, like he was, he, he was at a national, even international level for a very, very long time. And he was like Australia's prize, like one of, one of the greatest. He's now retired, but he will go down as one of Australia's greats. Um, and I got given this opportunity to fight Roy. I was back, I was ready, I was on it. And then I spent a big chunk of time preparing for this fight, trying to get as ready as possible. And then the, not even the day of I weighed in for this fight, I made weight and everything seemed to be okay. Everything seemed to be all right. And then I weighed in and that night I had stuck specifically to a, like a dietitian's plan. And I started to hear things funny. Like it felt like I'd heard, you know when you hear your own voice underwater mm. and it feels like muffled? Mm. I would speak and I would be like, why does my voice sound funny? Mm. It sounds like there's air like stopping my 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 body from getting the words out, mm. and I, my words sounded funny. And I thought, is my voice off? Like, because sometimes that happens when you cut weight, your voice gets a bit higher because your throat's dry. I was like, oh, that's nothing. And I went to bed and I had the worst night's sleep I've ever had before a fight. Mm. Absolutely terrible. Couldn't sleep, and it felt like the food was just coming up in my throat the whole time. And I was like, oh, it's all over the place. And I was up and down out of bed. And then the next morning, I just said to my girlfriend at the time, I said like, does this feel weird? Does my throat feel swollen? And it was really puffy. And she was like, stuck her fingers into it and it made a fighting sound, like <laughs> literally straight away. Yeah, wow. And, and it was just like, no matter what she did, she was, it was like a fighting sound. She said, there's fluid in there. And so she was trying to push it down oh. away from my head. She's like, we're gonna drain it, we're gonna drain it. Cause she was a fighter too. She knew that I had to get in the ring. Okay, she yeah. knew I had to fight. Yeah. And so she, she was like trying to push it down, whatever we gotta do. Yeah. And then I called the doctor, the fight doctor, and he goes to me, he's like, that sounds like you've punctured your lung. He said, there's two things it could be, but you've probably punctured your lung. Mm. He said like, or you could have ruptured your esophagus. Mm which means there's air leaking out of your throat, basically, into your, where your heart is and where your lungs and stuff are on the outside, where air doesn't go in your body, mm. which is like a huge risk of infection, really dangerous. Yeah, wow. you. Um, and I, okay, we were like, okay, let's go to the hospital. Because I was like, man, I'm fine. It's like, I'd feel worse if I had a punctured lung. Mm -hmm. Like, at the time, punctured lung sounded way worse yeah. than ruptured esophagus. Yeah. So I was like, nah, I'm fine, I'm, we'll go to the hospital. We'll get it checked and they'll tick me off and I'll go and fight. Mm. Let's just get it done. Mm. Went to the hospital and the moment I walked in, they were like, okay, I went straight through. I was like, oh no, that's not a good sign. Mm -hmm. You know, they sent me straight through. Mm. And then 
within maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I'd had um, like a few different scans. They made me drink the, I can't remember the name of the test, where they drink like that, you drink that fluid and it shows up it in the, blue yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I forgot, I forgot the name of the scan. Yeah, um, CT they, scan yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. that. Um, and they bring it back to me and they went, this is your lungs where your air is, and this is where the air is in your body and it was blue up here That's they were up. like air has leaked from your esophag like esophagus and you have an es esophageal tear so basically something we're assuming that food had torn a hole in my esophagus for some like for some reason had torn through my esophagus and leaked air into my body which meant that if i went and fought then there's a good chance that that infection will kill me before I get back to hospital. It's so good that you saw the symptoms before. Yeah, because I could have fought and, and when I asked the doctor, because our first reaction was like, what's the risk? Can mm. I fight anyway? Mm. He said, I can't stop you from leaving, but he said there's a 70% chance that if you come back, you'll come back dead if you fight today. That's enough for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, 30, 30%? <laughs> I don't know. Take the fight. <laughs> I don't know about that. And there's the borderline arrogance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Carissa, who was my girlfriend at the time, looked at me and burst into tears, and I was like, oh, it's terrible. And that was another one back down to earth straight away. Mm -hmm. The opportunities out the window. Mm -hmm. Boom, done. Um, and that was another, like, I just dropped me back down to earth, you know. You're not better than... What, what like what the world has planned for you mm -hmm. well, sit down so I did and it was a very difficult time um, off the back of that I got a few nasty messages stuff like that you know people wanting to tear you down thinking that you're scared mm. of this that's person right. or that person when in reality I think that's quite shallow to assume that I'd be scared of somebody when it's the biggest opportunity I've been given my entire life mm -hmm. I've been working for for 13 years mm. you know I'd, I'd been working my whole life for this opportunity and then it was taken away from me and somebody had the nerve to tell me that I was just afraid mm. and I just didn't want to do it on the day mm. and I was a bit a bit almost dumbfounded that people thought that and I got a few really nasty messages off the back even comments on my post saying that, like calling me names and stuff like that um, and that, that type of thing doesn't normally get through to me it doesn't, doesn't really bother me but um, being in such a vulnerable state, it did hurt a lot more, especially when nobody's ever doubted my Muay Thai until that point. Mm. Do you know what I mean? When I dislocated my knee, everyone went, well, we saw what happened. But because of like that being almost such a complex issue mm. and people not being able to see my knee pop out, yeah, or my throat tear open, then... That'd be a, that'd be Sorry, yeah, yeah well if people if people had have seen it they'd have moved on but because people didn't really understand what was going on they felt it was okay to just be be over the top like can i swear in this part yeah yeah i can swear okay. yeah i think yeah, 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 so. <laughs> yeah to be well kieran did it so yeah, we know yeah, we know, yeah. we know yeah. kieran then asks afterwards try, yeah. try, yeah. try and ask kieran to not swear for an hour you'll yeah. never get him on the podcast yeah. no chance yeah. um but yeah Basically, they were dicks. Mm. You know, <laughs> that wasn't even bad. People were dicks to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I had to learn to deal with that to do with Muay Thai. Mm. And that was my first kind of negative, negative, uh, my negative impact on me in a public sense. Mm -hmm. So, like, my first negative experience in a public light, should mm. I say. Yeah. Before that, it was people were like, oh, this new kid's so good, mm -hmm. like he's so, like he's up and coming, and then it was like abuse, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. First experience of that, and so that took a lot to get past. But after that, I I actually did really well for myself after that because in a mental sense, I understood what was going on. Whereas when I happened when it happened with my knee, I didn't. I had to wallow, mm -hmm. wallow and run away. Mm. is what I did for a couple of months when I when I fought and I suppose I I spent those two months when I did my knee thinking like why why do I want to do this why do I want to be me why can't I just be a normal teenager mm. so I would do normal teenage things I would go out do whatever with my mates just come home late not train be lazy eat shit like like drink Whatnot. And it was a, do you know, it was still a valuable experience, mm. 
because it's an experience that told me that I don't want to be a normal person. Because mm. <laughs> yeah. if I'd have kept doing that, then I wouldn't have enjoyed it. Mm. And once when I did that for that amount of time, it taught me that I no matter what happens, I don't want to be that. Mm. So this next time that it happened, I was able to pick myself up with support of good people around me, of course. And I was very grateful for my sister and my girlfriend at the time because they helped me through that time. And of course, my mom and my dad, but mm -hmm. particularly those two in that situation mm. were really helpful. The first thing I did was took time away with my sister, healthy time away, uh, and went on like a, a small getaway to eat some of the food that I hadn't been able to experience, mm. to sleep in bed for a bit longer, mm. to just experience like normal person things mm. in a healthy light, in a healthy sense. Things yeah. that I needed. Without going overboard. Without going overboard no, and no. almost binging on those things, yeah. right? Because when you're a fighter often, you hear it about food afterwards and people go on food binges. But it applies to everything. Mm. Like the reason people go on food binges is because they've had not a lot of food, but they've also had no social interaction. Yeah. When we fight, we're training twice a day. On top of work, man, nothing but exhaustion. We're always tired and we don't want to go out because when we go out other people are eating food you don't realize how often people are eating food until you're fighting you can't eat it with them and it just makes you miserable and you don't want to go mm. so you end up with no social life no food no nothing at some point uh, towards the way and you end up with no water and then you fight and you have all these things available so that's when people binge not just on on food but mm. everything else that yeah. comes with it it's the social aspect as well so i was able to healthfully reintroduce that while still being able to train yeah. um after that it was a it was a part of my career where it's quite a big transition where i moved out of home um and i left my dad's gym so i left my dad's gym to go up to a place called legends academy um which is in south perth which is about uh, 45, 50 minutes away from my family and their gym and stuff. Mm. Um, and I moved out of home and took that next chapter. And that was a quite a healthy move for me because I almost became like toxic towards my environment. I think towards the end of my career at, with my dad, I became almost, I started to lose my relationship with him. Like being able to talk about things that aren't Muay Thai, go home and not argue with him, and like those type of things. And no, no matter how much Muay Thai is my life, it's not worth my relationship with my dad. Mm -hmm. Like nothing is. So I had a long think about that. Um, and I also had a long think about what I wanted to do career wise as well. And Legends had the opportunity to give me a full time job in Muay Thai. Um, I was a sole contractor up there, but I made it work for me. Um, and that was like the beginning of working properly in Muay Thai, like working full time in Muay Thai. Um, and I also had quite a good like run up there. It was a nice refreshment for my mental, like being able to be out of the same environment I'd been in for 13, 14 years. Yeah. Um, moving up there really refreshed things, just new faces, new environment. Um, and good people, like to this day, Legends is like more than anything before I would say anything to do with training or anything like that, it's just filled with good people. Mm. Daniel Dawson is like one of the nicest people I've ever met. And he is like the, one of the best of Australia's known as far as Muay Thai goes, but he's one of those guys that's so humble about it that like he almost doesn't get given the respect he deserves. Mm. Um, but yeah, moving up there was a great opportunity for us, like for, for me to, to grow as a fighter and I had the opportunity to fight twice while I was there. The first one against Baxa Curry, which I took on quite short notice, but it was a good opportunity to get me back in the ring. Um, when I did that, it like, it, it set me back a light, if that makes sense. I took that on quite short notice um, and that, I managed to finish that fight in the first round knockout. And it was like, okay, cool, like I, I'm in a healthy place mentally. Um, and then I went from from that into 
the fight against Sing Payak, which was like Sing Payak is former Channel Seven champion and one of the greatest fighters that like has ever fought in Australia. Um, and I think he's been beat twice in Australia since he's arrived about eight years ago. Both like both losses against two ties. <laughs> So nobody in Australia had ever beat him. So it was a big feat, and, and he was a replacement for another fighter. Um, so it was, like, huge for me. But that fight, I felt like I'd finally made my statement. I lost on uh, a majority decision, which means one of the judges gave me two rounds, gave him two rounds and one round of draw. The other two, I would believe, and I would read the scorecards, they would be first two rounds to me, three, four, and five to him. So I lost by one round on two judges' scorecards, which is like hugely impressive. By, I mean, by other people's perspectives, everyone was quite proud of me. I would have liked to have beat him, mm. but I, for where I was at, I was quite happy with it. Mm. Um, and that like led me to, actually Kieran came to that yeah. fight. Kieran was in the back and he cornered Charlie, who came and sparred with us today. Um, and the next day I flew out to Canberra with him for a week. Where he, like, he kind of just picked me up the next day. <laughs> Kidnapped you pretty much. Yeah. He was like, yeah. oh, I can't believe this guy. Yeah, yeah, come come yeah. yeah. The weather's great. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. He lied to me about the weather. He said, yeah. you know, he said, Canberra summer is quite nice, but it just lasts less than Perth. That is what he said to me, right? He said that to me. Yeah. I've come to Canberra. My parents have been calling me all the time 38 degrees in Perth, 38 degrees in Perth. Never has it even got to like 30 <laughs> yeah. here. Not one time since I've been here. Dead. Yeah, to just pull you here somehow. Yeah. And I, yeah, I resent him for that. But now, <laughs> the, the opportunity has been, has been mad. But that's led me today, to, to today, I suppose. Like, now preparing to go, go and be ahead. And I think the main mental challenge of it all was just learning to deal with the test of time. Uh, like, things take longer than you planned before. It's never a smooth road. Like I had it planned in my head that I was just gonna like, storm through mm. because I have the ability to do it. I still believe that today. I have the ability to like to steamroll through like rankings, but that's not what stops people from steamrolling through rankings. From people like I don't know, like Roger Federer going to the top of Wim Wimbledon, he will have had a ride getting there. And it won't be because he lacked in ability at any point to get to where he got to. Mm. It'll be because he broke his wrist or like he, you know, COVID or yeah. like X, Y, Z. His mom died, his grandma died or something stopped him getting there, you know. It's not the ability that stops you, which yeah. is what shocked me. Mm. I thought if you're good enough, you'll just do it. Mm. But it wasn't that. It was like your surroundings sometimes knock you down. Mm. Yeah. And it's not about whether you're good enough, it's whether you have the heart to get back up and carry on anyway. Mm. Like, I yeah. think that it's was about something consistency, that, yeah. yeah, that's it, right? Yeah. Like, even when you're going backwards, you should be fine to go forwards. Mm. Mm. No, I think that's really powerful because you see it in all kind of atmospheres. Like, you see footballers, for example, like Neymar, when he first was coming up, you know, everyone thought he was going to be the next big, big thing. Mm -hmm. But a lot of his situations and environments have led him to not even being close to, you know, Messi and yeah. Ronaldo's level, you know? Yeah. You see it even in music where people say like, Jay-Z is the best ever rapper or this rapper is the best, but really there's so many rappers that we don't even know of mm. and so many singers, you know, in all mm. kind of atmospheres and it's yeah. like, it's really dependent on people's opportunity and that's kind of what we're touching on in um, the episode with Kieran as well where you talk about your football and I was like, it's not necessarily even the fact that, you know, you're not able to play at that level, it's just about opportunity and yeah. the opportunities you can get and in, yeah. in Australia the opportunities really aren't aren't there really for a lot of people yeah. You know what I mean? yeah yeah um i think that's like part of you you of course you can't you can't create opportunities out of thin air mm. but like you said about before when we were talking about working hard part of working hard is having the like the ability to adapt and to make opportunities and uh, like identify see opportunities them. and that is working hard identify opportunities mm -hmm. and and then taking those opportunities for example if i'd have stayed in perth i wouldn't have had the opportunity to go to england and fight in march mm. the homecoming yeah being able to recognize 
that Kieran can bring me those opportunities mm. was the step I had to take mm. in being able to fight there. 100%. And to have bigger opportunities. That is another way of working hard. Mm. I sacrificed and worked hard to get that opportunity. And mm. I also sacrificed a lot moving here in the first place to be able to get those opportunities. And all the work as well. and training is setting you up for these opportunities as well to yes. be able to take yeah. them out. Even. Yeah, for sure. And I think that was like, that's, that's another side of working hard that like people don't really, it's not as romanticized, right? Mm. Like being, being intelligent and making sure your decisions are wise mm. is, is like, is also a form of working hard. Mm. It's not just how hard you hit a bag or how far you run. Mm. There's so much more Mindset is super important. Yeah, because mm. I even hear, you know, a lot of people, they'll start a minimum wage job and they'll say, well, I'm only getting paid a minimum wage, so I'll give minimum effort. I'm like, really? If you put in a lot of time, effort into that mm. job, you never know what could happen, you know? You do really, really well in that job, you then progress, and then you can keep going up in that way, you know? But yeah. if you just don't put in effort because you don't see anything coming from this, then you can't be surprised in 10 years when, you know, you haven't seen those same opportunities that other people have seen. Mm. Everyone starts from different places, but it's really about, yeah, you know, taking advantage of the opportunities that come. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So what is next? What's next? What's next? <clears throat> Let's hype it up a little bit. As far as, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> hype it up. So, um, as far as fights go, fighting in March, 19th of March, fighting in Liverpool, on... Um, Disgusting place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fighting there, so I can't talk about it. <laughs> yeah. The teams, the teams, however, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going to Liverpool in March on the 19th. Mm. I'm fighting a boy who has just been crowned Lion Fight European champion. So um, he's coming off the back of a big win against a guy called, I think it's, yeah, Peacock. I can't remember his first name, but he's a good fighter in Europe. He beat, he beat um, a, boy, a boy for the European title. And so we're fighting, he's an Irish number one, and we're fighting on Andy Housen's show, um, cousin of Liam Harrison. Mm. who is like you know yeah. it's Liam and Andy Liam and Andy are like some some of the UK's like most well known fighters yeah. ever we were lucky enough to have Josh Josh who fights here Josh Tonner he fought Andy Housen on one championship mm. and that was a wicked fight which took mm. yeah, sure. I think I've watched that the so time many bomb. times we'll put it in the description yeah the time bomb yeah, yeah, go time watch bomb the time bomb Tonner <laughs> quick, quick shout out to shout Juice. out to Juice yeah <laughs> quick shout out to Juice. the time bomb Tonner <laughs> Um, but yeah, the, the opportunity to go and fight and also be recognised by him is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Andy did a podcast recently where he actually mentioned me as one of his favourite fighters. That's and to right, me, yeah. that's, that's pretty huge. Yeah. Yeah. You know, more than a lot of titles are worth. Like, it's a pretty yeah. big deal for me to be mentioned in the same breath as some of his favourite fighters. Yeah. Um, Someone who's been around the game that long as well, to yeah. mention your name. Yeah. It's quite surreal in a way. You go, well, okay, like I, am, I am getting noticed yeah. by somebody that impressive and that stature as well. Yeah, we live for that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for the bottle line. Because we don't do more time for money, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, we said my name. Yeah, said my name. Yeah, we're done. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. I put it in his Instagram bio, just yeah. a link to that. Yeah. 30 to 40 seconds that your yeah. name was mentioned. Yeah. 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 Living your best life that Yeah, one. take that Ronaldo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with your millions. <laughs> Who needs your millions? You Andy House and mentioned my name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That 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 was that's pretty cool, yeah. I suppose that like as far as Muay Thai and Korea goes, that'll be my next thing. Mm. After that I'll fight in I hope we were hoping in June in WA. Um we're just not sure now. Martin Gowan doesn't want us there, so yeah, WA perhaps. and the borders and all that. Yeah. Fighters, vaccinations, Messy. all that stuff. Yeah. Um, we just don't know. But I'm hoping it will still be a big year. If there's not an opportunity there, then we'll find one somewhere else. Mm. We're yeah. going gonna to really try and make this a big year. Um, I think as far as like... Because I, I suppose for me as well, what I've what I've noticed as well is, is that... Muay Thai is very important for me, but without everything surrounding it, it becomes kind of pointless. Like mm. it, so as far as growing as a person, Muay Thai helps aid in me growing as a person, but 
there's no point aiding the growth of a person that doesn't exist. Mm. Like I have to create that person outside of Muay Thai too. Mm. And it's been a massive year in moving away from my family, having no family and building a friendship group here. So over the last seven months, I've almost been building the foundations. I moved into my own place with a lease, like my own lease. Um, like everything I have here is mine. You know, like there's no turning to my parents when things get hard and um, that's been massive for me. And I suppose coming up will be, I think it's been seven and a half months now. So coming into a year of being alone, I suppose, mm-hmm. and learning to live alone, learning to be alone, um, which has been quite hard. You know, it's been quite hard when I've been lucky enough to have a strong family around me. Mm-hmm. Um, learning to only be supported through a phone has been has been a big learning curve for me as well yeah. um, but I think that growth within like that is coming too um, because the first six months were quite difficult in building a friendship circle and building a social life while training while fighting because in Perth everybody knew me and knew I was a fighter I knew when to call Max to come out when he was a fighter I knew when you know whereas here Building a friendship circle, especially after high school, is actually really difficult. Mm. Um, and then you get annoying people sending you memes 24-7. Yeah, yeah. I, moved to, I moved after high school as well. <laughs> yeah, this idiot. <laughs> I sent this story like 24-7. Yeah, oh, like man, stupid meme where he crops his face. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my <laughs> days. Oh, really. yeah. oh every, my days. <laughs> every every yeah. second notification I get is Ben copying me in another meme. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just showing my love and support. Showing the love and support. Oh my I feel it. Summer... Some are not that good. Yeah. I, after I send them, I'm like, oh. You know they're not good when they don't make this, the like the repost. <laughs> yeah. When yeah. I don't repost them on my story, yeah. knows they're not good. Oh, it does. <laughs> but yeah, like the the growth as far as that stuff is like really important to me. Probably not as important to like anyone who's listening, but yeah. like that that part is big for me because that's what's going to aid my performance. If I'm happy, I will fight well. And I will never sacrifice my happiness to fight. Mm. I know some fighters that are really good and they fight because they're really good, not because they like it. The yeah. moment I stop enjoying Muay Thai or the, the moment that I don't want to fight anymore, I won't, no matter how good I am. Yeah. Because I have the potential to be extremely good and a lot of people, if I stopped tomorrow, would say it was a massive disappointment. But if I didn't like it, there's no point doing it. Mm. Yeah, like if I didn't enjoy it. Mm. So, Tell me about what you want. Yeah, mm. and I think that I can see Muay Thai going in different ways for me. For example, if I kept doing massive weight cuts and I kept doing like unhealthy things like binging in my food after fights and things, I'd create unhealthy lifestyles which would make me hate Muay Thai. Or I could have stayed in toxic environments, which I was in in the past, where I wasn't happy with my surroundings and then I would resent Muay Thai for it. Rather than moving um, into a positive light or a positive place or making a positive change which has made me enjoy Muay Thai more yeah. rather than keeping things the same and just blaming Muay Thai for it mm. uh, because I do enjoy Muay Thai and I enjoy being good at Muay Thai and I enjoy all those things but like certain aspects you can remove to make your life better mm. like like which is why those goals are so important to me to build a social life a healthy social life um, and be happy by myself because that's what's going to aid my Muay Thai performance because yeah. mm. if I hated that aspect then I couldn't do the Muay Thai side mm. you know and building that around your lifestyle is very important mm. okay. yeah it's, it's really important because that really looks at well, not everybody but a lot of people look at the end goal of where they're trying to get to mm. and they think that's the thing that will change them but that's really, what Kieran was saying yeah, as well. yeah really yeah. have to build and even what you were touching on before you know where you're getting criticism criticism as well that's something Kieran touched on as well is yeah. when you get to these types of um, atmospheres or levels you have to be prepared to take both the good and the bad you know yeah and especially when you're just starting with something whatever you might not realize that no matter what you do some people won't like it you know For sure. and the criticism you get will you know be painful but you really have to prepare yourself and I think that would have really helped you as well when you got that initial criticism to say you know what actually I didn't like that but you know Mm. I can move past mm. that and not let it affect me. For sure. I think as well, learning to filter criticism. Mm. Knowing what's criticism and what's just shit Stupid. talk. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> like, I've learned a lot of That's that too. Great so, point, yeah. so, like, there's some people out there that want to help you. Mm. And there's some people out there that want to give you 
pretend they're helping when they're actually just trying to drag you down. Mm. And there's a lot of people that do that in Muay Thai because people can only get so far and then they plateau, but you don't, and they don't want you to go further without them. Mm. And there's a lot of people like that. Kieran and I have long discussions about things like that. Mm. And for example, when Kieran gives me criticism, I don't doubt whether he's actually trying to help me or not because, well, he's, he's, he's good enough to, to know the difference, right? Like him and I have that conversation. I know that it's to try and help me. Mm. The moment you start questioning whether that person's intention is to help you or drag you down, you should have a long, hard think about it mm. because there's no point taking in somebody's opinion when in reality they're not actually trying to help. Mm. You know, that taking that criticism is only worth taking if their intentions are like the right intentions. Like, and I use Kieran again as an example. When he says something to me, it's because he wants to help. And he's the harshest person there is to speak to me. No one else speaks to me the way he does. Mm. Well, because he's my coach, and so he's the person who's meant to speak to me that way. The only other person who would speak to me that way is probably my dad mm. or my granddad. Mm. You know, and and the way the way that he speaks, you know, and the way they can speak like that. The reason they can speak like that is because you know that your best in- intentions are in their heart. Yeah. When you know somebody's intentions are in the right place, you know it's real criticism. Yeah. It's not because they're trying to drag you down. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I think learning to decipher what's real and what's not mm. is very important as well. And that's a lesson that I've learned mm. over time. Yeah, I think that's really accurate because you were talking as well about how you know you just needed a break, especially when you had your injuries and you, you looked at kind of a more convenient lifestyle mm. and kind of mirrored some of those behaviors. Mm. And that's something I've found as well, you know, where I've never wanted the life of a normal teenager, but sometimes you look at it and you're like, wow, they just seem to have it so easy, you know? Yeah. So they can chill. do what they want, yeah. whenever they want, like I have to do this and that and this and yeah. that, you know, to get to where I want to get to. Yeah. And, and you look at it and you're like, wow, you know? And even sometimes in my life, I've just, you know, needed to have a break and say, so, even recently actually, you know, my grandfather just mm. passed away. So I just went ghost for a mm. while, just took some time for myself and just, kind of went into that more normal life where I'm just like, you know, watching Netflix and stuff like stuff that I never normally do because I've yeah. got a lot of stuff to do, you know? Yeah. But I think you actually need that time. I think you need that time. Like you said, you know, you had time where you just were in your feelings and upset or whatever, but mm. you need that time to then come back because mm. if you come back too early and you haven't processed those emotions and dealt with it, mm. then you can leave yourself in a more negative space. So I think, sure. that, you know, it's actually something I would personally encourage people to do is just take the time you need off to get yourself right again and then come back to whatever you're trying to achieve. Mm, I think, yeah, you've got to, <clears throat> you've got to establish a healthy boundary and under- learn to understand the difference between a healthy break and a, and, and a chosen break or a forced yeah. break. A big one we have in, in Muay Thai is like, is when, say for example, when Kieran tries to, well not tries to, just makes us not go too early or peak too early. It's what we call a forced break. He makes us do nothing. And to us, that's absurd. Mm. You do nothing. And, and if, you, if you take a break and it's staggered and uh, it's just an unhealthy sense of like, oh, I'm going to do it, I'm not going to do it, I'm gonna, then it's not, it's not the right decision. Mm. Yeah. But if you go, okay, I'm going to take this time mm. to heal mm. and to give myself a chance to level my head mm. and get better then it's what you need, yeah, definitely. you know what I mean? And I think sometimes a big part of that is having the right people around you to tell you when the right time for that is. Mm. For me, that's Kieran mm. or my mom mm. in two different senses, right? One in training and sometimes in life with Kieran too, but also in an emotional sense, often the person I'll call is my mom. Mm. And she'll go, just take a break, Yeah. stop. You know, and, and I think that, that like establishing those two is, is yeah. very important, yeah. That's actually really good, yeah, because I kind of have a tendency to just try and push through. And it was like mm. people, you know, from my world, they were telling me, oh, you actually need a break. Like you've been working so hard, especially last year, you know, just trying to get things done yeah. or whatever. And that's what made me realize, okay, yeah, mm. yeah, I actually did. Because that's when your quality slips as well, yeah. right? Like as soon as you, when you are lethargic, tired and, and in a bad mood or you've overworked, that's when your quality just goes out the window. Because mm. you need to enjoy it. Yeah. Whatever you're doing, you need to. For yeah, sure, make sure you enjoy for sure. It. Because otherwise you just start doing it mediocre. Yeah. And there's no point then, is there? Mm. You know? 
No, nobody wants to be mediocre and you can... Mm. And then you build that resentment because you're not getting to where you want to get to. Yeah, if, you're not man, if you there. enter something wanting to be mediocre, stay away from me. Yeah. Because I, <laughs> I don't tolerate that, bro. Don't. And Ben knows this when he comes to training. Yeah. Don't come to training and half ass with me, bro, because I, I have not got time for it. Yeah. Whatever you do, you should want to be the best at Be time. deliberate about your Yeah, time. 100%. Mm. Man, if we had a bottle flipping competition right now. <laughs> I'm trying to win. win. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. I don't. I don't have, like, if you're doing something for a reason, yeah. and that's obviously a bit of a, like, an over, overstretching, but, mm. like, if you're going to do something, you should want to do it. Mm. To the best uh, of your ability. To the best of your yeah. ability, and if you're doing it so hard that you're detriment, and it's the same as half-arsing it. Mm. And, again, that's, like, when people say working hard, well, you're not working hard because you're half-arsing it because you've overworked. Yeah. Take that step back and understand working hard is being mentally strong. And it takes mental strength to step back and then go again. Mm. And, and I think that's very important. And even to step back and evaluate your, your situation, you know? Because yeah. a lot of people just get so into the weeds of what they're doing that they don't even realise how they feel mm. or behaving, you know? Like, sometimes you just have to take a step back and have that analysis and say, where am I at mentally? Like, yeah. How am I actually performing? Mm. And you actually talked about that as well when you were talking about your fights, you know? And you said, right, you had this good fight after you came back and yeah, okay back you know yeah like you're having though you're cognizant of what is actually going on mm. within both your physical world and your mental world yeah for sure yeah yeah for sure all right um, that's pretty good yeah i'm happy to yeah. leave it at that if there's anything else you want to say any shout outs you want to give shout outs ah, well shout out to kieran shout out to kieran yeah more you yeah shout yeah. out to the more you fans and um, thank you for giving us the space mm. to do yeah. it in um uh, just thank you to, to I think at the moment I would like to give a big like shout out to the people who've been like a bit of a, a, a mental support for me I suppose um, and have recently like I haven't had much opportunity to say to them but like there's a few people who know who they are that have took me in in this like in, in Canberra since I came mm. obviously I could sit here and shout out my family for days I don't dad all that stuff mm -hmm. but I think as far as support since I've got here I've been very very grateful for those that I train with mm. um, and a couple of other people like one example maybe David right but the whole team Josh Gabrielle um, like Flav all those people that have took me in and, and like that's not not to say that it's just them it's mm. like the whole team yeah. from from top to bottom have took me in and they've been accepting of both my strengths they've they've welcomed that with open arms right but they've also accepted my flaws mm. because i have many mm. not even necessarily as a fighter but as a person mm. things that i'm trying to work on um that that can be quite hard to live with mm. one being arrogance right like there's times if there's a place where i'm arrogant it's in training yeah. and these people that have took me in within the team I haven't had chance to thank them personally, each person, but they've been probably not grateful, but they've been tolerant of my downsides. The same way like within a team or a family, you become aware of people's weaknesses or downsides and you learn to help them learn, like help them get through them or become, yeah. them or become better. Mm. And that's what they've done. They've been tolerant of my flaws mm. and they've helped me recognize them and they've helped me grow. Mm. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. You know, they've also been very supporting of me moving here and being by myself. So I'm very grateful for the, all of the, the more you fame, but particularly the fight team and, and, and the staff here at more you. Shout out Jush. Shout out yeah, Jush. Yeah, the Jush. Everybody loves Jush. <laughs> Except when he makes us do burpees. I still love him when he does that. Oh, it's borderline on me. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jush, I'm sorry. Burpees are disgusting. Mm. They are disgusting. Nice Burpees, Liverpool. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look fair, actually fair. Yeah, I don't, I don't. Liverpool is a football club, not Liverpool is a place. Yeah, Let, let's yeah, establish this at this moment. Yeah. Love Scousers. Until March the 20th. <laughs> <laughs> Once it's done and dusted. Yeah. And the question is, who do you like more, the Irish or the, or the Scouse? Oh. That's, the, <laughs> that's the question. Oh. The Irish are a pain in the butt. It's like, it's <laughs> calm down. I, I, it's calm down. I, uh, <laughs> I have see, see, I'm, I see I'm fighting an Irish boy so I can just like oh. trash out Irish, Irish people here <laughs> yeah. and now start like 
Start the bad blood now, get the tickets selling. <laughs> Fuck Ireland. <laughs> Kieran's, Kieran's half Irish as well. <laughs> this is a win right now. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what? A, a, funny, a funny thing to mention is Andy Housen, that we were talking about before, mm. has decided it's a good idea to um, to print oh, Kieran God. a Leeds top with more you on the back. Oh, and he says wow. he's going to have to wear it in the corner. Oh, when Kieran told him my brother and I, we stood down and just went, please don't. That's disgusting. Like, you know, cannot do that. Absolutely oh, disgusting. Day. Like, we were just hyping up Liam, but I'm sorry, yeah. mate. That's, that's just, horrible. That's just yeah. unfair. Right, so I'm going to go over there with my personalised Mac shirts coming soon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll plug myself. No, I won't. I'm going to plug myself. I'll go on. Um, I'm going to go over there. In description and and right Kieran's yeah, going to so whip his Maximus top off. And put a Leeds United top on in oh, the corner. That is disgraceful. Kieran, mate, what are you Old doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's pull out material. Oh, that is yeah, yeah. I injured, injured my foot in the back room. Can't fight anymore. Sorry, as soon as mate. Kieran puts the Leeds top on. <laughs> At least you'll have no food in your stomach after vomiting that. Out. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Mm. No, well, thanks for coming in today. Really appreciate no it. stress. Plus coming to you. Yeah, no stress. Mm. I enjoyed it. It was good. Yeah, a little fun. chat. Mm. I can talk for days, me. So part two time. coming. Yeah. yeah. Find the subject. Oh, we're gonna get you and Kieran. Yeah. Find oh, the subject God. that oh, Kieran and I don't agree on. <laughs> that would be that's All right. Uh, quick spoiler then. What is the subject you and Kieran do not agree on? I don't know. Uh, no, I just well, the problem. The problem is that's the thing, right? Kieran and I would have some really good debates and chats, but yeah. there's not too much. Can I just say I really like the way Kieran speaks. Yeah. Yeah, he's I really like it. Very intelligent. Very, very engaging. And, and, and articulate as yeah. well. Yeah. Very, mm. very. I feel like you've picked that up from him though. I definitely. Yeah, get I was. That sense. I was really yeah, good at talking, yeah, but true. probably yeah. probably not not as good as I am now. But I was always decent. Yeah. I was always decent at chatting, but. Um, yeah. Yeah, he's def- definitely helped. Uh, his voice like, sometimes plays in the back of my head. Smart, yeah, <laughs> like, he's very smart. Some of the stuff he says, yeah, he, it like stays with me. Yeah, he's he's quite articulate. Some of the things he says is uh, are very, uh, like they sum things up quite nicely. Mm. He, he sums things up quite nicely. Yeah. Puts things into perspective very well. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Definitely thankful for him. Top load. But you can't keep that on the podcast. Yeah, we'll cut that part out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>